Discover how smarter project insights can lead to better project outcomes. Hello, project people. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Project Chatter podcast. It's always great to have you with us. And it's good to have you back, Mr. Dale. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, what's happened this week? Not too much, I think. I've just been watching the Djokovic case in Australia. And uh, yeah. I see you letting anyone in these days, right? Well, he's number one, so we thought I would give him a pass. He's all right. <laughs> we, just, we just want to test him. It was a test. He passed. <laughs> Very bad. Uh, no, back. Yeah, I was actually trying to book my tickets to the Australian Open, um, and I just realised how late I am booking them, and they're like seven hundred dollars a ticket for the final. So um, that'll be fun. But uh, look, let's get into this uh, very exciting pod as usual. Um, I want to welcome our guest, Ian. Welcome to the podcast, mate. Glad to have you here. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, nice to be here. He's got a lovely background too. So anyone who's watching the YouTube, I love that tree in the back. It's uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> It's a, but, it's a Google special. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to look this one up. But look, it's, it's always good to have uh, fellow project controls slash program managers on. Uh, we can go so, where, so, so many places with this particular podcast, but I always like, and it, maybe it's a selfish thing, Dale, that I, I really like hearing where people come from, their, their roots, if you like, their origin story. I'm, can, we, can we learn a little bit? Where did you come from? How did you get into this sport? And, um, sure. and where are you going? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please, please to share. Um, so I've been doing this about 20 years and uh, my background is um, getting a spider crawling up my shirt. Uh, my background is, fortunately, I'm in New Zealand. So the spider is, uh, can you see that spider on my face? No, I can't see it. Um, but, uh, I anyway, um, it's, it's a spider that's not going to hurt me was what I was going to say <laughs> as I'm in New Zealand. Uh, if I was in Australia, I might be more concerned. Anyway, um, my background's computer science. So I did a computer science and electrical engineering degree. And um, then I was looking around, well, actually then I went and worked for a student union for a year. But after that, I was looking for a real job and I stumbled um, into rail track as it was back then. I forget which iteration it is now. And the train protection and warning system program as it was, not that I really knew what any of that meant um, at that point. But I was doing that in York, which was where I studied, um, originally from Aberdeen in Scotland, and started on that program with some database uh, stuff, looking at, they were managing their system. It was a safety system upgrade. There was a big accident outside London back in 1987, and they wanted to put some new equipment on, on the rail there. And so what I was actually involved in there was they had a, a, you know, surprise, surprise. They didn't know the status of their assets. So they had a big database they needed to, to update to, to get the status of their assets from surveys so they could assess them to see if they needed to install this, this safety system or not. So I started out there. That moved into, uh, ended up moving down to London and working for Parsons Brinkerhoff, as they were um, back then, who were running the program. And uh, actually similar to something we were talking about just before we got started, uh, Val. Guy there, a uh, guy by the name of Keith Crow, who's a Texan, it's, it sort of tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, I think you might be quite good at this project controls thing. Uh, I still keep in touch with Keith to this day. And so that was where it all started. And so that then I sort of charted through, went along to Metronet, large scale programs, worked for myself for a couple of years, did some Olympics, did uh, some stuff with Deloitte on the NHS. Um, Costain, a few others doing bits and pieces, and then CH2 and Hill asked me if I'd join them, um, which after a little while I did for the Tideway program there in the UK. Spent a couple of years working on Tideway in the early days, then moved out to the US and ended up running CH2M's project and program management group. So that sort of ended up being around about 400 staff across the globe doing what we do. Um, that merged into Jacobs. Uh, then I, myself and my wife, she's from New Zealand, decided it was time to get back to uh, New Zealand back in 2018. So we did. That changed my role with Jacobs a wee bit. Um, went off and had a little bit of fun in Germany, starting up the Sudlink program there with, with Jacobs. Um, although I ended up doing most of that remotely because uh, uh, some, uh, some 
nasty virus that you might have heard of turned up. So that sort of had an impact on where people were living. And then just this past year, moved over to AECOM, looking after large scale programs. So with a focus on um, making program controls work as best it can to deliver all this huge amount of infrastructure investment that's that's coming down the pipe pretty much everywhere. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about what program controls versus project controls is, at least in my mind, a bit later on. And that's me. Here I am talking to you guys. That's fantastic, mate. And, um, you know, it's quite a varied uh, collection of different roles. And we often find that project controls and program and project people do do tend to wander. You know, it, it, it's something in our blood that, that gets us leaving our, our, home count, our hometown, our home country, you know, exploring, um, pioneering. And it's very interesting that you had a computer science background. So maybe we can tap into that. Um, I'm actually going to pass to Dale this time to start off with some of the questions and some of the deeper details and see where we go from there. Awesome. Nothing like, uh, you know, hospital pass straight up. No, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it is early for Val. Ions, yeah, so, that's uh, that's a fair point. Yeah, that's yeah. that's yeah, yeah. Well, well validated on his hospital pass there, <laughs> <laughs> and and he's still waiting for the caffeine to hit him. No, so I, I think you actually um, started off with actually a really good question, probably a rhetorical one, because if you look at what the topic is that we've got for this program and project controls, the ghosts of yep. past, present, and future. Now, before we even get to the ghosts of yep. the past, present, or even, dare we say, the future. <laughs> We've got program and project. Yep. Now, in many senses, we get taught in all the various types of project management certifications. This is a project, this is a program, that's a portfolio, blah, blah, blah. What yep. does yep. that mean in the context of controls, though? What yep. are the differences between those two? Great great question. And um, so this is, this is my run, I, and I'd appreciate you know, your, your views as well, obviously. Yeah. And so, well, if you were to boil it down really fast, um, I would say someone who can, someone who's going to be a great program controls manager will be a great project controls manager, but the corollary is not true. Yeah. Um, and so the project controls, it's that core um, discipline that we know it's scope, schedule, cost, in, in my book, it's actually risk and document controls as well, because I don't think you can really mm -hmm. do it without those two. Um, and, you know, cost estimating is, is dashed in there within that cost piece. Um, but that's the, you know, it's for a project which has a sort of a, a, a finite deliverable, right? So, uh, you know, to use a context that um, often using, like, imagine an, an Olympics and Olympics is a program building a building a stadium could be a project right so you have a you have a thing and you're going to have the controls and it's actually it's almost a, a stadium is probably an extreme example a, a better example is probably you know a, 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 an upgrade of a B road to an A road in the UK or something like that right there's a project to do that and and the scope is fairly well bounded um, it's not always related related to size but it's fairly straightforward here's a scope take that scope control it execute it you know you're you're done um when we look at when our, or when i think about programs you need all of what we what i just said all of that is still critical and important but there's all this other stuff and um it's really around complexity so you know going back to that um uh, olympics example you know, you could say, oh, well, the objective of an Olympics is to build these stadiums and, and do this and that and the other. And there's a whole bunch of enabling utility work and all that sort of thing that you need. And that's true, but that's not really why you're doing an Olympics. You're doing an Olympics to create this, you know, spectacular event. Um, have there's, there's other benefits, you know, generally it's Renault you know, or maybe not so much these days, but certainly in, in the Olympics in recent decades, it was about um, reinvigorating and reinventing and leaving a legacy behind that was better than it happened before. And that's really what you care about. That's what the, what, why we are doing it. We're not, you know, we're not doing it to build a stadium per se. We're doing it to achieve this, this bigger end goal. And when you're doing those programs, there's, you know, 
there's stakeholder engagement, there's politics, there's um, there's land acquisition invariably, there's, a, you know, a whole um, example, a uh, host of permitting, you know, you look at a program like Tideway, um, the means by which it ultimately got its license to go ahead didn't even exist when that program, you know, the, the approving authority didn't exist when that program commenced. Um, and so building a system that can control all of what is important and let you know whether you're going to actually deliver those things that is the reason why you did the program, that's a different skill set to, to the core project controls piece. And dare I even say there's a bit more art in it than science, I think, at times. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, that's my, that's my distinction between program and project controls anyway. So, so yeah, so, so I would tend to agree with you um, where project controls is far more in the detail and it's far more about focused delivery, as you say, of, of deliverables, work packages to that scope. Um, and it, it's, it's almost a more strategic level when you get into program controls. It's, it's far more um, considerate on the benefits and the outcome. What is, what is actually the bigger picture as, as you're alluding to? And that does take a shift in mindset. Yeah. And yeah. often, not, not all organizations are set up this way, but often in my mind, I often look at, well, how is the delivery structure? So are there project directors in place? Are there program directors? Are there, you know, are there program managers, project managers, assistant project managers? What is that setup like? And then from a control standpoint, how do we have to support that delivery organization? And if it means that it's, as you say, it's got that complexity in it, then you need these multi, multi layers in the control space as well, because then, then you go beyond uh, program controls. There, there's another layer potentially above that if required, you know, I mean, some organizations, Val and I have spoken about it before, are looking at, you know, um, controls directors, project controls directors. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think you're right. It, 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 there is a distinction. Um, but I think it's always, as we always say with, you know, when it comes to projects, it, it depends. It depends on the yes. organization, depends yeah. on how your projects and your programs and your portfolio is set up. Um, yeah, you could even get a portfolio controls manager potentially. Um, potentially. potentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that we, I mean, we could probably debate the semantics around naming conventions the, the whole day. Uh, but Yeah, that we could spend an hour on that one on its own. <laughs> I don't know, it would be a very interesting hour, but I'm sure we could spend an hour on it. <laughs> I, think, I, I think for us geeks in the control space, it's very interesting. Maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and if for no one else, maybe we should, but no, maybe we should. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I, 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 do, I do want to get into the ghosts of past, present and future though, because just listening to your intro there, you have a fascinating career path to date and it certainly sounds like you've seen a hell of a lot of ghosts um <laughs> but maybe well, maybe, maybe some spirits as well along the journey with those ghosts yeah that's right that's right yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, well i, I, I think as long, as long as long as you understand that you know there's good and bad ghosts right it's not it's not it's not a horror story <laughs> uh, this, this analogy is starting to go a bit wrong isn't it um but um there was, yeah, I mean, I think there was just, uh, just before I do, there's sort of one point, um, you're, you're, you're bang on the money there in terms of, you know, I mean, programs are what I've really, you know, I, I had the fortune to sort of stumble into programs from the word go, um, you know, so that um, uh, TBWS, Training Protection Warning System, that was a 500 million pound program. And that was in... Oh. 20 odd years ago right so um i can't i can't do the inflation on that in my head but i suspect that makes it billions by now uh, yeah. fairly comfortably um so and i think you know so programs is very dear to my heart and um that whole organizational at the moment is a, i'm sure there are other podcasts out there but it's you know the, the whole thing about why programs are or are not successful a huge part of that is around the organization and um, governance structure right without those things you're um you if you don't have those building blocks we could do the best job in the world as controllers and you still wouldn't be successful um and i think you know i'll sort of maybe save this thought for the the ghosts of future um 
which is, I think, particularly early on in those programs when you are establishing those governance processes and so on and so forth, because they can it can take a while, right? If you're build, bringing something that large together, um, the challenges laid at our doorstep as controls professionals on what is the best way to control that? Because once you get into the, and you could call establishing the means for an approval for a large scale program a project, mm -hmm. but bringing the traditional controls tools that you would bring to executing a design or a, or a construction job to that piece of work, it's not going to work because you don't have a certainty of, you know, your scope is very vague um, or the, the minute you delve below anything but a very superficial level, um, the, the scope is very vague. So therefore trying to apply a sort of, you know, strict um, breakdown and control methodology to something that's somewhat ephemeral, it, it, it's not going to be effective and it's going to be frustrating for everybody involved. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, that's the, because because the controls folk aren't going to get what they want and the other folks on the projects are just going to, they're not going to see the value, right? And yeah. I remember, you know, you and um, Greg were talking about time to value on the last pod. And yes. that was, you know, I think that's a, you know, that's a, um, I probably put that a slightly different way and I'm, I'm stealing one of my bullet points from later on, but <laughs> it makes sense for it to go here. Um, I think um, for me, what's helped me, um, be successful through the different parts of my career is a focus on you know pragmatic controls right what are we doing this for like it's it's you know it, hey i love coming on a podcast like this and talking about the fineries and the geekery and the details right but at the end of the day we only exist as means to control to, to deliver the things that we are controlling so yeah. we're not here to do scheduling and we're not here to generate reports. I mean, that's what we have to do, but that's not yeah. why we do those things. We do those things in order to achieve a, a build or a goal or an upgrade or a whatever. And unless you've got to ask yourself the question every day, pretty much, which is, you know, is what I'm doing today actually helping? <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and you're right, Val, and I used to do this with our team. When we work mm -hmm. together, we used to say, you know, is what you're doing today contributing to the delivery of the project? Ask yourself mm -hmm. that. You know, if it's not, then question why you're doing it. You, That's you right. And you mentioned reporting, right. for example. When, yeah. when, when we came together to lead the team, we said, right, let's write down every single report that we do every period. And I can't remember the list, Val. I think it was like over 70 odd. So we just yeah. looked through it. We just scratched them off and we said, right, we're only doing these 20. Yeah. And no one else asked about the rest. And so <laughs> yeah, 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 that's know. right. And and I bet the quality of those reports went up, yes, and the yeah. use uh, and the level to which people actually used them and believed them went up. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So it's yeah, you're bang on the money. Bang on exactly. The money. If I just put those uh, ghosts on pause just a little bit before we get to, I just I just want to <laughs> they're, rewind. They're just hanging out yeah. over yeah. here. You know, they can float. <laughs> they're ghosts, man. I just I just want to rewind a little bit because I want to get your view on this. You mentioned tools. And obviously, mm -hmm. we'll go into the future of software a little bit because I know, you know, that's something you do want to share with the listeners as well. But when it comes to structure, and we spoke about, you know, the various levels, project, program, portfolio, potentially director level controls, yep. how fundamental is it to get the tools correct in order to control the various levels of project, program, portfolio, et cetera? I've I've got a bunch of things to talk about about tools. Everyone loves talking about tools, right? <laughs> um, but um, actually, to answer your question there, um, my experience is, I'd flip, I'd flip it. I'd say what it's important to do is not to spend too much time debating which tools you're going to use. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's where I've that's where I've seen it fail, right? Um, which is if it, it, so. Is it vital that you bring a tool set to a project and a program? Not necessarily, but um, what I have seen is that if you don't come with a concrete proposal, you can end up spinning your wheels, you know, being terribly inefficient at the beginning of a, a particular program if you don't bring that offering. Um, and so that's, you know, 
particularly for program you know everyone likes to think they're special right you know um and that is true of projects um but it is certainly true of programs like there will you know when you're doing something that's costing billions of dollars it's almost guaranteed in fact i haven't seen a case yet where this is a program yet where this is not the case there's something about the particular scenario the be it geography politics type of work whatever it might be that means there's a little bit of a different flavor to how it needs to be controlled to be successful um so i think the important thing is both in the context of process and overall delivery but and tools you should be able to very quickly move to that discussion you don't need to be having a discussion about the vagaries of exactly how you might you know spread the cost loading in your schedule compared to your um you know your budget and estimate because they don't you know uh, by definition they're not going to line up all the way down to the bottom you know like you you get project controls folks in a room we can talk about that shit for weeks um but the reality is for the program pick one yeah the, uh, you know the reason there's the debate is because there's lots of different approaches you could take there and and most of them will be successful so you know my approach is that you bring a version of that and you as quickly as you can you elevate the conversation to okay what what are the metrics or measures or um truly unique facets or aspects of this program but also project i guess that i think there's probably i i would challenge that there are less in projects than there are in programs but you know I, I'll, I'll, I'll keep an open mind um you know you want to move the conversation to that piece which is what is truly unique and what actually do we need to do differently in order to address the actual requirements of this thing we're doing as opposed to you know mm. debating the panatone shade of our navel fluff <laughs> um in the vagaries of, of controls you know what actually I'll, I'll just a quick comment before i hand over to val when you're speaking there i was thinking back on my career and you're so right when i was a project controller and i wanted it to be perfect everything needs to line you know you know yep, the, the, yep. the single hour that i put in the schedule needs to come out exactly to the 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 pound you know when it comes yeah, yeah. Oh, six decimal places if, we, yeah. if we're, if we're doing it <laughs> i i used to I used to get frustrated, like, why don't the managers care that this doesn't align and blah, blah, blah. And then as yeah. I progressed in my career, I went, okay, there's reasons why it doesn't matter to the minuscule scale. But yeah. but it, yeah. it, it's good that I think we do have project controllers at that level looking at that minute detail. Abs absolutely. At that level. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I get the nuance now, but those, I guess, starting their career off in controls, you'll probably have the same frustrations with us that are now yeah. going, well, that doesn't yeah. <laughs> we're, we're all just slowly turning into our fathers and there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> exactly, well, exactly. I've always said that. I think, I think everyone, I, I don't say it on the podcast too much because it might offend someone, but I, I do say that most people in project controls are damaged. And I said it in, in the nicest possible <laughs> In the nicest possible way, yeah, absolutely. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I mean, like, uh, there's something about detail that we can't let go of. And uh, I remember, I mean, using back in my, my days as well, what I, I would use Cobra and, and Cobra had this thing, this log. And if anything was out, you did would you have think a balance. of Cobra because I said six decimal places? Because that was exactly the tool <laughs> I was thinking. <laughs> it reminds me of some of my ghosts of the past and, uh, and having to sit there late at night, figuring out exactly where I put uh, my, I got, I got, I've got this unrounded figure in undistributed budget and it needs to be distributed. Where do I put it? Oh my God. If my boss sees anything in UB, I'm in trouble. And I would sit there and uh, I'd be like, what? And I, I was lucky enough to have some great mentors, uh, as I, we said before the podcast. And, and I had this old guy, uh, Craig Terry, and he would sit there and he would slowly go through everything. And it was great until I realized how slow he was to find the answer. But he always found the answer, but it would take yep. at least two days. So yep. it's, yep. Um, it, it is interesting how, how we do seem to stick to some particular things. And it's, not, it's, it's like an ism, right? It's kind of like this OCD of, how things work and we want to get that that exact property right and it wasn't until i got out of defense actually that i realized um no one else does this <laughs> it's yeah. it's really it's really yeah. like a, a roundup kind of situation and uh, six decimal places what's wrong with you you know they, they looked at you with a cross eye they're like that's right really? that's right well, where'd you come well from? I, 
you know, I think we're, you know, we're going all over the place here, but that's all right. I've, I've listened to the podcast. I know that's the deal, so that's okay. <laughs> um, but I think, um, you know, that's this is this is some of what I see as a future, which is um, the challenge has been that you know, if you think about scope, schedule, cost, risk, documents should they must align right they must be aligned at some level um but in order to have them align all at the lowest level um can you do that yes you you know i'm thinking particularly in the cost schedule risk piece here you know in scope but you need an army of project controllers right and so um and if you can afford that army then i guess great but um you know the, the ai would challenge do you you know can you achieve the same with less mm -hmm. um and then which you know over the past few decades i think that's you know i've certainly seen that proven but for me some of the exciting stuff about the future is you know we're getting to a point with the tools now where a lot of that donkey work if you set things up correctly at the beginning, a lot of that donkey work that needed that army of controllers, we can actually design away. And then so, you know, today I would say, look, you know, don't make uh, don't make perfect the enemy a good, like get that alignment as best you can and then go from there. But the sort of exciting stuff is, well, you know, if we really make the most of, of, you know, everyone loves to talk about AI and, and machine learning and whatever, as a, as a computer scientist, you know, I have a little bit of insight into whether that's, um, or, or as a once computer scientist, I should really say, uh, it's a long time since I did my degree, but, um, you know, I, I have a, a healthy degree of skepticism around that one. Um, but if we do that correctly and have them do, ha have a machine do those mundane tasks, and actually I think there is the possibility that you could, improve that level of alignment you know um, without having to have the army still the question in my mind as to whether that actually helps <laughs> but you know yeah. I, I haven't yeah. given up on the six decimal places yet that's what i guess that's what i'm saying no well. <laughs> no, no and, and it, you said that you, you struck a, a chord with me i think a lot of executives as well they want the bottom-up view but they only want to pay for the top-down effort and so yeah, usually yeah. they said, no, no, we want that detail, but I don't want 50 people there. And it's like, mm -hmm, well, mm -hmm. <laughs> and before AI, this was a real challenge. And I, th I think you're right. There's, we used to call it low value transactional work, right? Yep. Yep. Moving sheet from sheet, moving spreadsheet to this, integrating these two, that, that shouldn't be done by a person. It's, it's very mental. Yep. It's very hard and laborious. And um, it's great that there are tools out there that are starting to be used in that space. And so I will just, while we're on the topic of tools and we can move around Excel, Excel is a tool. And I've been on many projects where Excel is the tool. And, um, I look, and it's more for the listeners, really. Um, I I've, I've, I've been on enough projects and I, and I want to know if you see the same trend. I mean, it, it seems to go forward and then back a few steps because I think that the, the attractiveness of Excel as a tool is the fact that you can, anyone can use it. It's easy to learn. It's everywhere. Uh, it's malleable. Um, and you can make it pretty, right? I've seen some pretty impressive stuff and you can automate it to a degree with macros, et cetera. So there are facets of the Excel <laughs> industry, let's call it, that work. But when it comes to playing with others, sharing and caring you know and really managing things like audit trails and traceability it becomes a bit of a problem yep. but people won't let go of it so i wanted to know on for your from your perspective and and a tool perspective what's what's your view on take on that that's um you know what you know what that is a perfect intro actually to the ghosts who would have thought perfect yeah yeah, yeah yeah boom ding 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 um so um you know so that you know this construct the ghost thing so you know what i was thinking is you know you and you, you and i were all exchanging an idea it's kind of like look you know i've been doing this for 20 years and i've had the, the career pathway that i've had and and there are sort of some observations that i have about what's good and bad uh, about what we what i have done what i'm currently doing and what i want to do so that's the sort of that's the, the construct if you will and so um when i was thinking about the past 
the the very thing I wrote down on my bit of paper to the left hand side here is Excel. It's exactly and you know, don't get me wrong, I, I love Excel, right? I've done some cool stuff in Excel. Mm-hmm. Um and I was thinking about it, but you know, if I wind back to that first engagement I had on on um programs for the tvws program i was actually looking i ended up being the reports manager there was actually a guy who went before me whose name was david something that i can't remember who was brilliant um but what we'd done there was um we had all our data in an access database and well excuse me when i got there it was in excel and he'd written a bunch of macros um in excel and word if you've ever written macros in Word, um, or excuse me, if you haven't ever written max, uh, <laughs> macros in Word, don't. It's horrendous. It is the worst object model you will ever. Well, no, this is this is fifteen year old information. Maybe they've improved it wonderfully since. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. Sorry. So he'd written this sort of system to cobble it all together through Excel and and, and Word. And so what I did was I took a bunch of that information, migrated it into Access, um, you know, put some structure around it. And we had um, we had eight different regions working on that um, program and we would collect weekly updates from them. So they would, you know, we'd send out information, they'd update it, they'd send it back to us on a weekly basis. I'd integrate that. And where I got to was what my Monday mornings consisted of was me turning up, dumping a bunch of files on a network location somewhere hitting the button in excel and going away for five hours um and and well actually watching the screen for five hours to make sure it didn't crap out that was actually what yeah. i was doing um and it didn't generally and you know and then all the reports got spat out at the bottom that was it um and so what i thought about it was you know excel is basically access programmed by com- people who don't really understand computers like like it's because they really they actually mm. do very similar things um it's just that you have to be more structured and you have to understand data in order to be able to use something like access whereas you don't to use excel you can just start putting shit in a sheet and off you go. Um, and the upside of that is um, that, yeah, it's, it's, it's lowest common denominator, right? It's, it's anyone can use it in theory. The downside of it is it's lowest common denominator and anyone can use it because I'm sure you both have come across this where you open a sheet and you're like, like, what is this? Like, you know, who, yeah. who thought about this, you know? And it's, um, you know, and people get bewildered by the fact that, you know, one ra- one row or a million rows, it's all the same, right? It's just another row. It doesn't matter how many rows there are. It's the columns you need to be thinking about. Um, but if I think back to that, back in the, you know, 20 years ago, um, actually the advantage then was that the tools weren't as good. Excel was not as good. It was not as easy to use. You could not produce nice looking stuff so easily, which meant that the the responsibility to do that was in the hands of the ilk of us three, um, who at least had some comprehension of what we were doing. Um, so, you know, you had, you had the, um, the production and the data validation was focused in the controls team and it it had to be so people were sort of aware of computers but they didn't actually really have to know how to use them very much um because we were doing it for them and so we would generate a report and take it to them and that would you know that's that's what the controls process looked like so as as long as the communication was effective then we could be effective as controllers and people sort of they they understood and appreciated that dynamic because they didn't really want to do it. Um, but what was bad about it was, um, you know, we're a choke point, right? The project controls folks were a choke point. We're the only ones who could do it. And, you know, the apps was, were pretty slow to develop. Even the, you know, the, the um, uh, 
commercially available products, you know, didn't develop as quickly as they do today. They didn't, you know, you actually could get yourself in trouble um, mm. with commercial products back then. You know, there were commercial products that claimed to do things that really they did not. Um, so it was, you know, there was there was a bit of a wild west there. And, you know, on the one hand, there was a bit more control in the hands of the controls folks. But on the other hand, it meant that people almost had a license not to understand it because they weren't doing it and we were just spoon feeding them. So it's like, okay, well, it meant the quality of our data was probably better because you had a smaller group of people who really knew what they were doing actually responsible for it. But was the comprehension, you know, where was the comprehension of what we were doing? Um, there was almost a bit of a get out of jail free card because folk couldn't get to it. So therefore they could, you know, hold their hands up and say, I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, yeah. that's 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 my ghosts of the past. I think there's probably a whole bunch more that I haven't touched on there. But <laughs> no, no, we're all just resonating with you, of course. And you mentioned this; it, it, it I, I just recall the same experience and it becoming a bit of a bottleneck. And and uh, you know, everyone became sport children then because they were entitled and they were like, you know, it's like that girl out of the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You know, buy me North Korea, Daddy. You know, like they they just wanted everything. And you're like, they come to Project Controls because you are the gunsmiths in the west right and they said yep we need yep. this 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 and this and you're like oh and you become yep. this yep. grand architect and I, I laughed when you mentioned the types of spreadsheets i've received and experienced over the world it'd be great to actually get something like that dale can people send a snapshot in of all the you know, don't, don't release any <laughs> data that you shouldn't send me the crappiest spreadsheet you ever see if you've got snapshots or you've got a version of it get it up there on linkedin or wherever i mean it'd be a good laugh and we can all have a look <laughs> it'll, be great. So, it'll be it'll be the project chatter podcast project controls museum there you <laughs> go the there excel. you go there, there you go, go. I was thinking like the Excel experience, you know, you can just get everyone kind of just having a laugh with each other. But right. um, no, I, right. I appreciate your experience and it's, it's great and colorful and uh, exactly what we, we experience as well. So fantastic. I, I actually had one more question and we can go into your, whatever ghost you think you've got in your pocket and it might, it might align. Hopefully it does. We seem to be on the same page there, Ian. Um, how important is it to understand, I've gone deep now, see everyone serious, seriously looking at me? Yeah, serious tone. Yeah, yeah. How important is it to understand um, the the ability to craft quality questions? Because just thinking about how you talk and how Dale speaks, and just the observation of some really, you know, great people in projects and how they they do carry themselves, there's something around the line of inquiry and how they get to the truth. And I realized this way later on. Right? I'm I'm pretty slow, so I I realized that uh, in order to get the quality out of people in order to get the right insights out of the project that I need to, to do for my job, I needed to ask quality questions and that's yep. not taught anywhere, by the way. So I, I kind of say that saying, thinking about how maybe the listeners might be thinking about, it's not just the tools because we, we talked about that, but it's also about how you engage with others. And I wonder if you've got any few comments on that. Yeah. Well, well, once again, this would almost seem like we had collaborated ahead of time, which we did somewhat, but not to this level. Um, yeah. In my ghosts of present, uh, um, one of my little bullets that I'd highlighted was um, communication is key. Oh, nice. Uh, so, um, so yeah, you're you're absolutely bang on the money. Which is, um, you know, what was or, or where things were successful you know, my early career where we were doing all that, you know, yes, it was somewhat more mechanical stuff, but what, what made, what I saw it successful was because, um, we would, well, for me, I did have a machine that could produce the reports reliably, which meant I could spend time looking at what the, what the analysis actually told me, and boil it, turn that into terms that someone who wasn't as au fait with the data as I was could understand. Like my program manager on um, uh, on that job, or, or, there was a couple, but uh, one in particular, I remember Richard Lungless, who's a great guy. Um, you know, what I really got to the point was when I took the reports to him, I'd taken the reports, but, you know, here's the reports for this week. This is the three things, one thing, two things, four things that you actually need to, to know this is what i see 
from this week's updates, right? This is this is what is or isn't happening, what's good, bad, or ugly. And so I think there's there's that side of the communication, which is that um you always need to, you know, and you're right, this is I mean, this isn't really anything to do with project controls, I guess. This is really just to do with being a human. <laughs> um, and it's easily said and hard to do. Um, which is, you know, put yourself in the other person's shoes to some degree. Like, what do they, what do they need to know? What do they care about? Where are they at? What are they thinking about? You know, and and how do I convey that message? You know, that's the on the on the output side, if you like. I think that's you know that is, uh, and I'm sort of I'm uh, in the future space. I'm. I'm working on some things that I haven't quite got across the line yet, so I can't be as talk about them as fully as I would like to. But you know, I think there's um, there's space in our industry to provide you know training and, and mentoring around um, that side of things, right? Because you could have the best program controls engine in the world, but if you aren't communicating effectively, forget about it. So there's you know mm. there's there's definitely some skills there, and that's on the output side. On the input side. Um, you know, the longer answer to that is, um, you know, I've moved, well, I think we've all moved around sectors quite a lot, right? And uh, although the peculiarities of how controls are executed in those sectors, you know, there's, they're executed perhaps differently, but the core principles are the same, right? You know, scope, schedule, cost, risk, documents, it's, it's, it doesn't really matter what job you're doing, you can use the same principles to control it um but it is worth getting to know the job that you're on so you know uh, and that you don't have to be a technical expert There's plenty of technical experts on any given project um but taking the time to understand a bit of what it's about you know read the scope um understand the context and the but the reason you do that is um you, there's no such well there's no such thing as a dumb question well there are such things as dumb questions right so <laughs> you don't want to ask a totally you know at least at least you know consume the information that's available to you so that you have some idea of context of a project um then ask dumb questions because they won't be dumb questions um you know and that's on the i think for me that's on the input side right so both when you're building um a, a model to start with be it you know schedule cost um, whatever um, ask those open questions because quite often you'll find that the open questions are the ones that get the most answers well I mean excuse me that's true of all open questions but I mean you know seemingly dumb questions um, because quite often what you'll find is that people in an organization have all thought it's a simple answer and, but they just have three different simple answers to the same question. So, you know, you mm. asking that seemingly dumb question will actually unearth, uh, you know, some some assumptions that are not common. Um, and then that sort of, that, that that's when you're creating things. And when it comes to updating, I'm afraid there's, there's um, you know, I don't know how we teach this, but, you know, it's tenacity, right? Like if, if you smell bullshit, you don't have to, you know, throw your hands in the air or call bullshit, and blow the bullshit alarm. But, you know, just to ask another question, you know, like, because uh, mo- mo- you're probably not wrong, right? <laughs> so, you know, uh, so the, you know, and, and consider context, right? You know, the perpetually 90% complete guy um, or girl ask, you know, ask another couple of questions. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. That was a bit of a rambling answer there, Val, to your question, but that's uh, oh, it's good. Yeah. It's good Communication is key, right? That's it's... yeah, yeah, and it's obvious. And, you know, some of these asking the obvious question can be really useful, particularly when you know management decide to have a really big meeting with a lot of people in the room. Like, it's very easy to uh, get lost in the noise, but it it's it's useful to, to stand out and and just state some fundamentals. And this is why I think Dale and I do it a lot on the podcast it, it actually comes from our career so it's like state the baseline what's the definition what are you trying to yep. say yep. and it's actually helped our communication massively just being on this podcast iron and speaking to people like yourself and getting down into the detail and uh, i i do i do feel for some people when i know i i see a good planner 
that, for example, who could be a great planner, but, yep. but he, he's not really, or she's not really inquisitive enough or curious enough. Uh, Cause you know, I've got this mantra that people on their behavior. So something could happen, you know, engineers r- walks off all stroppy with his update and there's something behind that. Uh, or, you know, there's something presented, which we know isn't facts. As you said, you can smell the bullshit on the paper. It's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. there in writing or it's, it's a, it's more philosophical than that. Maybe it's not sound or it's not a valued argument. And you're like, well, what's the premise of this? And mm-hmm. I actually think it would be great if, if more people, I think we've had Warren on and a few others talk about the philosophy of projects. It'd be great if more people did some courses on critical thinking philosophy and brought that back into project controls. Cause I think project controls is an amal- amalgamation of all sorts of different sports and theories and methodologies. Um, you, you're nodding there. So I'm, I'm guessing you're agreeing. I, I, with me. I'm nodding. I'm what I was actually, I may have been smirking because what I was actually thinking is <laughs> I think just, you could just take the project controls piece out of that. Just say it would mm. probably be good if most people did. <laughs> Cause it's, I mean, it's what we're talking about here. It's not, it's, it's fairly simple concepts or precepts, um, but it's hard to do, right? I mean, standing up in a meeting, especially if you're a, you know, a junior controller or whatever in a big meeting and, and stating the seemingly obvious that will actually call someone out on their bullshit or misunderstanding. Like that's, it's a pretty gutsy move, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's easy, you know, and, and, um, understanding other people's points of view and where they might be coming from and pausing to actually think about um uh, you know where they're coming from that's again you know that's it's a simple thing right it's a simple human Mm. interaction thing but it's actually you know this wasn't something i'd written down but it was something that i sort of you know encountered over my career which is you know you you go through um you know academic education and, and university generally and you've sort of been learning you know principles and then you get out into the into the big bad world um and start doing work and it can be a little bit bewildering right because you're like oh my gosh there's all these processes and procedures and legality mm. and you know law and oh, oh, oh gosh i don't want to oh god oh yeah right oh and i remember there you know i was with the metronet around just i left a little bit before they went into administration so you can imagine that was a you know Mm. an organization that was there was a lot of stressed people in that organization right um and so i remember being quite stressed myself about oh gosh is there something i you know have i done something wrong here or uh, uh, um and then i sort of you know i don't know if it's 10 years later or whatever you realize actually yes there's all of that stuff but at the end of the day it's just people you know most most of what we do right is people doing things and so actually if you can um you know remember that (laughs) remember you're a human here's another tip Um, (laughs) remember you're a human and there's humans all around you right and and you know and i think one of the interesting developments in our developments in our industry um, and it sort of it is taken off globally, but, you know, more so in some areas of the world than others is this sort of recognition of mental health, you know, and it's like, you know, particularly in construction, for example, which, is, you know, historically has been a bit of a macho sport, um, you know, that, you know, I'm, it's great to see that taken off. There's an organization here, actually, in New Zealand that focuses specifically on the mental health of construction workers because they've seen an actual and steep decline of it with the whole um you know covid pandemic situation and you know this country has been nowhere near as affected as many so um uh so yeah i think there's uh, yeah that's the like we're people doing things with people and so remembering that people you know folk can have an off day or they might be stressed or i know maybe their cat's just been taken to the vet i don't know you know there's there's any number of things that could have happened right um and so understanding that, I think, is is, is useful for, um, you know, ev- well, everybody, not just controls. Maybe we can lead the world in sort of empathy and something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was about to say that. We've had a few pods where we've talked about, you know, kind of, um, I guess, what it, what it takes to be a leader. And, and I kind of subscribe to that servant leadership model. And I know mm-hmm. it, it, it's a hard job. And, and I, I actually think, to some degree, being a positive, there is a silver lining to being in COVID with isolation 
if you do want to speak up, it's it's actually a lot easier. You know, it's yeah, it's probably less it's probably less daunting on a on a on a screen like this than it is standing in front of a room of twenty five. But I still think that yeah, we emphasize communication a great deal, which is great. We're aligned. I love this. It's great. Um, I was going to ask another question, but I know Dale's got a few around the future, and I think this is this is the fun. Oh, well, it's fun <laughs> for me because I love the future. Um, Dale, over to you, mate. Thanks, Val. I'll, I'll comment a little bit before we get into the ghosts mm. of the future. I mean, you mentioned people as well. So there's people and there's ghosts, which is fantastic on this podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I do agree with what both you and Val are saying around the questioning and the communication, because there is that sense of curiosity. As you say, from the input perspective, when you're looking at data as a controller, you're like, well, why is that like that? Can I figure that out? If not, you know, maybe dig for it type mm -hmm. thing. And then adding to that as well, one of my favorite quotes, I can't remember who said it to me, it might have been Dave Pulford, Val. Um, you know, it's it's challenge the greens and support the reds, right? <laughs> and often, goodie. and often it's not like that. You see red no, and no. it's like, why is that going? Whose fault? Blah, blah, blah. Actually, no, mm. red means we're telling you there's something wrong here and we need your help. Um, yeah, and actually challenge the green. I haven't, I haven't thought about it that way before, but I, I've probably behaved that way before. But I haven't thought about it so succinctly. And that's a, yeah, that's a really great point. Yeah, yeah, and and so that's always stuck with me as well, ever since I've heard it. And then I also, while I was listening, I was thinking about you spoke around tools and software and communication and reporting, and we spoke around all the various spreadsheets you get, and I just wonder if. You know, the commonalities you talk about, whether you go from one sector to the other, the core stays the same. Is there perhaps a core suite of KPIs that project organizations should be considering to, one, reduce the overhead and costs of producing bespoke reports that actually tell you the same thing that something else could tell you? And perhaps there's also an education piece for those that are looking at the information data coming out because as we as we've kind of alluded to you get this one manager or this one director that wants this report that's because that's just what they're used to yet yep. they're, they're not willing to kind of shift and learn something different and so maybe there's a bit of work we need to do in that space so actually this is a nice core set suite of reports that yep. all projects should should adopt because and we don't really like to use the word best practice but Maybe that, that it's, a, it's a good core to have. And then around that, we dotted, we can have some bespoke outputs as well. So th those would be my comments on that. I don't know if I, do you want me to stop and do you want to comment on that before we go into the future? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think there's there's a sort of bridge there, actually, from the present Great. to the future. Awesome. Um, and so, you know, when I think about... Um, the, I mean, I mean, yes. Actually, I was having a conversation about exactly that this morning, um, Dale, to answer your question, and you know, and I think it also ties back to that um, point I talked about earlier in terms of you know, when you're starting up a project or a program, you want to get to the the bit about what is truly unique because there probably is something that's truly unique. But yes, the core delivery KPIs and functionality, there's. Uh, there's a real you know there's a lot of opinions about those you know are they are they you know is there real variety there but i think you know if i were to look at where um the industry is presently versus where it was 20 years ago um the reality is it's actually in the same place like we haven't we haven't really moved on so um you know, so I think about, you know, I'm a, I'm a computer guy, right? So it's one of my sort of, you know, pastimes and passions. And when I was growing up, I actually, my, my mother just sent me a photo, actually. So I have a five-year-old daughter and a six-year-old son. And so uh, my mother and I, uh, my mother's still back in the UK and we would exchange the stuff over Christmas. And she sent me a photo she found, which was of me with my first computer when I was six. Wow. Um, which was um, an Acorn BBC B+. Plus. Mm -hmm. which i don't know if you guys you it was a, it was totally a uk centric thing right um so your listeners will likely know that but you may not but anyway um acorn don't exist anymore they went bust in 98 or something like that um but um what they were doing 
they were, you know, they initially created that computer as a response for the BBC in the UK to for an education program for kids to learn how to use computers. And when they moved from their 8-bit platform to their 32-bit platform, which was a huge leap at the time, everywhere, PCs and such like were still in 16-bit, there was an engineer there, Sophie Wilson, who created a chip, um, which they called the ACORN Risk Machine Chip. Now, you might recognize that acronym, which became Advanced Risk Machine, or ARM, yeah. um, which powers everything, right? It's powered the mobile revolution, right? Because of the, um, you know, I can get into a deep discussion with you on risk versus CISC computing architecture if you want me to, but that really is really off course for the podcast. Um, but basically what it means is it's, it's their lower power consumption chips. So, you know, that whole mobile thing that we have with phones and tablets and laptops and everything, I mean, not, maybe not so much laptops, but phones and tablets, is a, is a genesis from that thing. So in 20 years in the technology space, we've gone from, you know, having something on our, our, our there must be something on our desktop to having an equivalent amount of power or more in our pocket that we carry around with us every day. And um, so, you know, one, I guess two things I was sort of trying to highlight there. One, you know, I don't think what we do in controls has, I don't think has really changed at all in that time frame. Um, and two, the genesis of all of that was one person, right? I mean, I'm sure there was a team around Sophie Wilson when they built the, you know, the arm chip, but it was, um, Sophie's credited as the sort of the brains who came up with that, right? So I think there's always, there's always more and there's always other things we can be thinking of and adding to. And so, you know, that's where, this is where that bridge into the future is uh, uh, for me, which is, um, you know, what is controls, right? Because, you know, you say you do project controls and people look at you and nod their head and go, oh, right, okay. Is that like project management? And you go, yeah, sort of. And that's the end of the conversation. Um, and, um, you know, simplistically speaking, right, we build a model. We build a model of um, scope, cost, and time, and we track that model. That's And the fundamentals of how we do that today are the same as they were 20 years ago and and they don't necessarily need to change because actually there's some there's some solid fundamentals there right but i think there's there's sort of two um major aspects that i see of, of what we need to do to, well maybe it's three um, to improve those into the future um one is that benefits and outcomes piece right no one does a project to spend time and money no one does a program to spend time and money. They do it to achieve the thing. And so when we're proposing the, you know, an approval or otherwise of a change order, yes, we need to be able to tell people what the uh, impact is in terms of cost and time, but we should also be able to tell them what the impact is in terms of the benefit or outcome that the project is actually trying to deliver in the first place. Because that's hey, this is going to use $500 million worth of contingency. No, I'm not doing that. If you don't do it, you're not going to reduce your journey times by five minutes like you said you were. Oh, okay, I'm going to do it then. Um, you know, it's a very simple concept. Lots of people think about it. Lots of people talk about it. But I think there is a, there's a challenge for us as an industry to actually embed that into our controls engines th such that you can understand those things. I mean, it, it, you know, you want to talk about fuzzy logic and not having everything lined up neatly. Y there's no way you could have that lined up, you know, all the way down any given hierarchy, but you could still have a fuzzy logic relationship that, that, that says, okay, well, hey, this thing here impacts this thing here and so on and so forth. So I think there's, you know, trying to push the boundaries of, of how we contextualize control and relating it to what we actually are doing. Um, and then there's, I will pause for breath in a minute, I promise. Um, there's, um, there's the tools side of that, which is, yeah, there were tools you could really get yourself in trouble with 20 years ago. There's a lot of really good tools out there. Um, and so how do we, 
how do we utilize them best? And I think also there's a challenge for us as in the industry to turn it into a industry led product development as opposed to a software vendor led product development. And last but not least, it's the people, right? And we need, we need to give um, an easier route in and a better, more well-established framework to, you know, not A, for people to enter the, to, to appeal to people to want to enter the industry as project controls folks and, and um, help them learn, but also, you know, frankly, to combat the fact that there's a, you know, I hire, I've hired a lot of people over the years. I've seen a lot of CVs. Um, there's a lot of shysters out there, right? Yeah. And, and well, after you've done it for a little while, you start to see the, you know, the giveaways and the telltales and so on and so forth. But there's a lot of people who, you, you know, if you didn't know the industry, you could have two CVs for one job and they could both re read absolutely fine. And this person will be great and this person will be dog shit. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> and there's, <laughs> um, and so I think there's, you know, that's, there's a real credibility challenge for controls in the wider project management, project delivery, program management, program delivery um, uh, space because of that. Because if you've, if the only controls you've been exposed to is dog shit yeah. controls, <laughs> oh God, hey, where am I going? Um, well, you know, you're, you're right. going to be naturally skeptical, right? You know, as, mm. as, absolutely. You, you spot on there because you may not know as a controls professional that what you're doing isn't actually that great. You may not know because that's yeah, the way you've yeah. been trained, right? There, there is you're, no you're, you're giving people a lot more benefit of the doubt than I would. You're a nicer man than me, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but in truth, if, if, if you think about it, um, you, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And because our profession is not as large as we like to think it is, I mean, one of the reasons we do the podcast is to share the inside information. Hopefully that helps. And mm -hmm. I was telling Val um, towards the end of last year when I went to the expo in the UK, I was chatting with one of the delegates there after one of the presentations and embarrassingly, she said to me, I recognize your voice. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you on the podcast? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Um, and she said, well, thank you because what you and the guests are doing have actually helped me in my career. I'm new to project controls. Uh -huh. And I was like, wow, that is amazing, right? That's great. Yeah, and, that's and awesome. We, we talk about the future and the pipeline and we talk about technology and how we have to harness technology to help project controls professionals because there's not enough of, of us around and so we need to harness it yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's a difficult one because we spoke about a little bit in the in the last pod as you alluded to with greg around tools and the way tools are going and you know what, what do you say to someone getting into the profession today you know because of the way technology mm -hmm. is advancing mm -hmm. where do they concentrate i mean they've got to understand the fundamentals they need mm -hmm. to have experience to those fundamentals Yet what we're actually saying to them, well, a lot of those fundamentals will be done for you because you won't need the abacus or a pen and paper. Yeah. There'll be the calculator, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a yeah. very, very difficult space to be in. And then compounded mm. Mm. is this, as you're alluding to this whole demand where governments are throwing money into various sectors, particularly infrastructure for yeah. the economies. And we're going, well, actually, we don't have the people to deliver. Yeah. And so... Yeah. It's it's this catch twenty two, and it's a, it's it's a hell of a tough one to try and solve, because in a couple of years' time, I think we're going to have a whole bunch of messed up projects, and mm. it's going to yeah. end up yeah. costing the taxpayer more money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it also, um, you know, it also doesn't reflect kindly on the industry that we all work in, right? Exactly, yeah, you know. <laughs> exactly, because there's just more delayed projects, more and more delayed yep, projects. Yep. But anyway, we are talking about the future, and we don't want to be too bleak about the future. <laughs> there's opportunity, right? I mean, massive, surely. massive. Um, I felt like Val wanted to say something there. Val, did you? No, I just, you didn't I mean, say no. I was. Uh... <laughs> no, well, when you when you're talking about the CVs, there it was it was awesome. I have been I've been fooled many times, and. Um, you know, I, I thought I was buying some, I mean, I do this when I buy, when I shop, you know, I buy something that's too small for me or whatever it is. I just, yeah, right. I just hate being ripped off. You know, I, <laughs> there's something about it that just, it was because I don't think a lot of, so there is this, there's a, with intent and there's without intent, right? 
I'm talking yes, about those yes, that go quite. out there and they, they embellish their CV and they go with, with it, intent. Yeah, deliberately with intent to oversell. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and it's very hard, at least from a CV perspective, because everyone's got major, major projects on their CV now. They've, you yeah, know, yeah. Everyone's got a B. Yeah. You know, I've been working yeah. on this billion dollar project. And somehow we've inferred that working on a billion dollar project means you're good. It means you're good. It means yeah, you're, that's right. It means you're great. Oh, yeah, you've worked yeah. on Sydney Metro. Fantastic. Oh, wow. Well, you must, you must know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, so interest, I do, interestingly, I find that actually, you know, so one of my little tells on that is if someone's only ever worked on large scale programs and only ever worked on them for relatively short periods of time, that's a red flag in my book. Right. Because yeah. you can hide on those programs. Yes. It's, it's easy to turn up and not really do anything. And then leave again 100%. before anybody has actually worked out that you don't really know what you're doing. Now, now, on the corollary, to your point, there are actually some folk who are very good at what they do and can move from a program to a program to a program with just a relatively mm -hmm. short engagement and add real value and do great work. Um, but yeah, I, I would, I would, I would propose that that second sort of individual is less common than the first. <laughs> Sadly. You know what? It's, it, it actually doesn't take us long to figure it out because the community is so small. Mm -hmm, you probably mm -hmm. know someone that knows that person. I'm this finding that out more and true. more. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that oh, can okay. work for or against you, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, so, yeah, so well, yeah, especially, yeah, actually, 100%. Ahead. Well, if you say like, because they'll say, you know, I've got 10 years experience, great. You know someone that I know. You know, yeah. and it doesn't yeah, yeah, take yeah, long yeah. to find out. I've actually yeah, yeah. had on Dale's point. I've actually had people say, "Just run." You know, don't don't hire those people. Yeah, right, right, um, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, and uh, and and so pivoting to the more positive. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think there's, um, you know, like you, you guys are Greg on. I, I I love you know Greg's a super smart guy. I find it very interesting. You know, listening to Greg, he's got all sorts of you know he's. He's got an astrophysics degree, right? He's going to understand things from first principles. He's got to. Um, so, um, but I think there's technology, you know, you had that whole thing about, you know, kind of, I forget the title exactly, but, you know, what I jotted down here was, I'd actually said, technology can't help. And then I said, oh, I'm just doing that to be, uh, to be provocative. Technology can't help on its own, yes. right? It, or not as much as it could. Like, if we just, you know, and I think to your um, point, uh, Dale, around coming into the industry, I think there's there is still good real value in understanding those prin the, the core principles, right? The basic principles, first first principles. You can almost forget about them. You know, ideally, you should almost be able to forget about them immediately because actually, you've got a system that does most of that stuff for you. Um, but you'll have a much better comprehension if you understand that. Now, the thing I'm working on that I'm being vague about um, is, you know, I don't think there's a good industry body that enables that right now. You know, I think um, the APM does some of it. Um, the IPMA does some of it. The PMI does some of it. But I really think they're focused on project management, not controls. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a space out there for a... a, a um, an industry body that could that could help with that that actually focuses in on the on the uh, controls functions that actually ties in that other piece that we were talking about earlier in terms of the communication right in terms of the human aspect so not just the um, um, the sort of academia if you like yeah. but the um, the actual you know how some of the practicalities of it as well and so and I think we need to build that platform so that you know yes there's those folk out in the market who you know oversell but most people aren't socio or psychopaths right some of them are out there but most of them aren't so actually if you gave them a platform that they could upscale themselves with so that they weren't faking it till they made it anymore they've actually made it now i think the vast majority of those would you know drag themselves up a bit some of them wouldn't some of them will uh, and then that gives you an entry for you know it gives you a common understanding it gives you ability that you know for industry it's the advantage to industry 
in that people can move around a bit more easily because you do actually have some faith in what they can do and so on and so forth. Um, but then, you know, so I think that's, um, that's part of it. And then the other part is, you know, we have a whole new, you know, the way people interact with technology, the graduates and, um, trainees that are coming in now like you know i see it with my kids um, who are only young but they have a whole like all of this stuff's existed this is you know there's no the idea that any of it would be done on paper um uh is just it just it doesn't exist it's yeah. not it's not that they can't figure it it's just it, they've never witnessed it it doesn't, doesn't it's not there and so mm. you know on the one hand you know, that thing I talked about in the ghosts of past where people weren't that comfortable with computers, um, but that's gone. Everyone knows how to use a computer. So that's a real advantage. Um, but in the same stroke, that doesn't mean they necessarily understand, yes. you, you know? So, um, so I think that that's the, you know, we've got a, you know, the idea that we're going to send a new scheduler away on a, three-day Primavera P6 training course, it seems like a bit of a old-fashioned um, concept these days, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And I'd argue for it, except for the fact that actually, you know, those Primavera training courses don't actually teach you anything about scheduling at all, right? They teach you about Primavera. Oh, at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Software. And so, yeah. uh, you know, I think there's, I, I don't have the answer to this one. I don't know what it is, right? Because, you know, my, I started out in this industry as, you know, or, or very early on doing a lot of scheduling and sort of, you know, part of where I got my early advantage was because I did go on those training courses and I did take the time to understand it and I do know how it works. And it's actually been, you know, mm. part of what's helped me call bullshit on other people along the way, right? Because you know, like, oh, no, there's a couple of little questions I can ask here that I know what the answers are and, and you know, they probably won't come back to me with the, the right answer. So, you know, there's still value in all of that, but you know, on the one hand, there's it's, we have instant access to everything in our everyday lives. Right. And so, and I think that's actually, I think society is getting damaged a little bit by that actually. So I think there's a certain amount of that you have to just say, look, actually everything being instant is not healthy. <laughs> No, <laughs> exactly. you know there's there's a little bit of restraint and patience that needs to be applied but on the flip side you know we need to challenge ourselves in particularly in the tool space as to you know that's a question i've always asked myself which is you know would i be willing to do this yeah you know before you go ask someone to generate a report or do a monthly update cycle if you look at that monthly update cycle and go oh my well that looks bloody horrible but hey you know then they would only got a couple of years experience that's you know they've just got to cut their teeth um that's not fair it wasn't fair 20 years mm. ago and it definitely isn't fair today so you know the challenge to those of us who are a little you know further along our careers and more senior is we should be building systems that take it that leverage the technology and 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 that's where i think the software vendors have got there somewhat in the in the offerings that they've built um but you know we kind of need to i think the impetus is is on the industry now to try and be more um consistent about how we execute controls and actually you know help partner with the software vendors so that we can you know we develop things that are together to develop things together that help us execute projects better like that's you know that's that's the real thing right we've got all this infrastructure you know i'm a comes the company i work for is an infrastructure and so that's what we're looking at right and i feel the responsibility because it's like i think we can spend the money better mm. not that it's all about the money but money doesn't grow on trees although quantity with quantitative easing it sort of does but uh, <laughs> it's all going to come from somewhere at the end of the day right ultimately it comes from somewhere and I just, you know, particularly with all these large scale programs, it's like there's, I think we can control them better, um, which gives us, you know, hey, I'm not necessarily saying that will reduce the cost of something, 
but I'm at least saying that it will give us a better visibility of what something is going to cost as early as we possibly can. Um, preferably yeah. before we've really started because you know that <laughs> you know i mean there's a, there's been a lot anyway I, I, there's 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 a lot of stuff that's improved in the last 20 years right the whole optimism bias stuff some great you know some great work in the uk and you know some of the collaborative work and stuff coming out of ice in the uk and those sort of things like there's people are trying to push forward with the overall delivery of infrastructure um but you know there's still to this day you know there's that thing of like oh yeah well yeah this program will probably be yeah we can do it in five years come yeah yeah oh yeah the first number right first yeah. number that anyone says that's the number um, yeah exactly exactly no you know what i mean time's gone by very quickly but you've given us so much to think about there and almost that that last segment there i feel like that's a perfect setup for a follow-up with you i and where we could you know muse and, and yeah go. yeah there's yeah there's there's a bit of meat in there isn't there <laughs> yeah yeah because we don't have yeah. enough time to to explore all of that um but just on the 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 benefits section that you you mentioned as well and how there's opportunity in that space for us yep. do you know steve wake yes yeah, yeah i um I, I don't know if steve um would know would know me but i've okay. certainly met steve yeah. way back in the day i know i know who he is and okay he so maybe we'll put you in touch with him as well because he's he's mm. huge in the benefits management space he's, he's developing uh -huh. the standard here in the uk we've had him on yeah, the podcast I, a couple of times and he's I'd, coming back I'd, as well i'd heard about that i think because he, he's working with um is he working with ian mins on that i think actually i'm, I'm not sure i'm not sure sort of um, standard. yeah 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 I, I i think i know what you're talking about but yes there's yeah that uh, yes yeah, he's a great guy yeah so we, we actually we've got steve at the end of feb um coming back to talk about that actually there we um, go so yeah so if you if you want i shall, to, I, shall uh, pen, I shall pencil it in for listening <laughs> fantastic <laughs> all all you listeners pencil in for listening but hey look, that's right we, we don't want to keep you too long because we know you are stuck for time. Um, we got one quick fire pop quiz, which is a feature. Five Ooh, okay. quick fire questions all about yourself. So are you ready? Uh, um, um, uh, so the quick fire questions, are they supposed to be quick fire answers? To yeah, you? quick fire answers too, <laughs> if, you can, if you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. No worries. Question one, early mornings or late nights? <sighs> early mornings. Two, what are the three must-have behaviors you look for in successful project teams? Um, uh, open communication. So, uh, I guess that's one. One is uh, honesty is actually what I mean. Yeah. Honesty. Um, commitment. And uh, I'm going to double down on honesty, um, <laughs> which is being willing to deliver bad news. Oh, nice, mm. nice. Question three, what is the best book you've been gifted? Oh. Um, <laughs> nothing whatsoever to do with work. It's called no um, Save Our Sleep. Oh. And it was um, how to look after, how to get um, babies into a sleeping cycle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Every single books. parent needs that. Yeah, agree. agree. It's, I don't generally give advice on parenting because I think it's a very, you know, personal yes. thing Agreed. but the one thing we tried to do the whole baby led thing and the thing that i quickly certainly seemed obvious to me and you know i uh, my children seem to be doing both absolutely fine on an academic point of view but babies are babies and they know shit about shit <laughs> so the idea that they're somehow going to find their way into a natural equilibrium i struggle with so and that book gives you a structure not to and so that's, that's, anyway. Brilliant. brilliant anyway there we go <laughs> that wasn't very quick sorry no, all good all good <laughs> question four what advice would you give your 10 year old self oh my 10 year old self um it would be don't be afraid to believe in yourself very good advice for any 10 year old yes. question five if you could choose one person to be stuck with in a lift who would it be and why uh well the the the, the immediate answer is my wife because that's why she's my wife 
Uh, <laughs> Very good. Um, well, yeah, there you go. That's it. I'm sticking with that answer, actually. Fantastic. Yeah, first answer, <laughs> final answer. <laughs> no That's asking it. the audience. <laughs> well, Ryan, it's been amazing to spend the best part of over an hour, actually, with you. Um, you know, we went all over the show. We spoke about ghosts, spirits, people, everything. And I just want to thank you for your time. But before we let you go, any final thoughts you want to leave our listeners with? Um, no, I think we're... Um, I think we I think we covered some pretty good ground there, guys. I think um, you know, just maybe just in the context of um you know, opening the door to as many people as possible, right? It's a it's a really interesting uh sector that we work in. Mm -hmm. And it's a really interesting time to get involved in this sector. And so, you know, for all of yeah, for those people who might be listening who, you know, are just listening yeah stick stick your toe in the water it's I, I don't know if it's warm it might be quite choppy but it's interesting anyway it's exciting indeed and we do have to give a shout out to ollie wade for putting you in touch with us thanks ollie uh, yeah, I, I of course, of course. yeah absolutely it's a pleasure to be here guys love talking with you no thank you vel any final thoughts from you no, that was a great episode. I think we, we've we just opened the door, having your eye on. I think there's many more um, subsequent podcasts to come with you. We loved having you on. Thanks for your time today. Of course. Thanks. So, folks, you've heard it. That is all the time we have on this episode. But remember, you can help by paying it forward and share this episode on your favorite social media if you don't mind helping us out. A massive thank you once again to our guest, Ian Kamsen. And thank you all for listening. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive and have fun doing it. From me and Val, it's bye for now.